Well, uh, welcome to Hawaii. Uh, wonderful to be here and uh, wonderful to be back. I think this is the 14th or 15th year now, so it's become a great tradition. As you can see from the uh, list of uh, questions that I'm going to attempt to answer, we're going to cover some very small subjects today. Um, I got interested in this subject when I wrote an earlier book entitled The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, The Conflict Between Word and Image. And um, the question in that book was, why is it that uh, we know from, from historical evidence that there were every single ancient culture in the world, men worship women? Uh, that's not open to debate. I mean, Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, Japan, China, Greece, Rome. And then along came these three Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that denied the existence of a goddess and had a very hard part of the patriarchal edge. Well, I, uh, many people have written books about this, but I came from a different perspective, and that is that I performed vascular surgery for many years uh, as, and uh, operated on people's carotid arteries, their brains. So I've long been interested in the differences between right and left hemispheric functions. So the thesis of alphabet versus the goddess that was, it was the invention of writing, particularly alphabet writing, that um, transformed and reconfigured the brain and we know from brain scans that people who are illiterate have different brain scans than people who are, live in oral societies. So I, the, I propose that learning how to read and write unbalanced the brain, giving more power to the left hemisphere over the right hemisphere, and that produced the disappearance of the goddess. Uh, that led to so many questions that um, people raised that I felt I wanted to explore this whole question about men and women even further. So I wrote this new book entitled Sex, Time, and Power how women's sexuality shaped human evolution. And um, I, I'd like to begin by introducing you to the rather astonishing fact that uh, we humans have opened up a chasm between us and all, uh, every other animal. Uh, we know that the common chimpanzee, who is our closest relative, shares 98.6% uh, of the same genes that we do. Uh, you shouldn't get too excited about that because we share 40% of the genes with a banana too, so. <laughs> Now, about uh, 40,000 years ago, something rather dramatic happened. We don't quite know exactly what it was, uh, but uh, humans uh, began to uh, exhibit the, all the characteristics of human societies today. And we, I think th what happened is that we had three incredible momentous insights. And the, the first insight is that um, women grasped the connection between sex and pregnancy. I mean. Uh, you know, there's all these uh, animals out there that are doing it, and, um, and it, it, there's nothing in the observable behavior of any of these animals to indicate that they, any of them have the slightest idea what the purpose of sex is for. But if you asked uh, this critter, uh, why do you think you have sex? Uh, this is probably the response you would get from him. Um, they don't, if you ask the dog, uh, you know, when a female goes into heat, why do you feel compelled to mount her? You know, this would be the response, you know. <laughs> so, um, so somewhere in our distant past, some woman somewhere has finally figured it out, you know, and, and it dawned on her that pregnancy was the direct result of sex. And once uh, she made that insight, um, uh, she realized that she could die as a result of having sex because uh, childbirth and maternal mortality is the highest among human females than it is among any other animal. Now the second momentous insight that changed this as a, as a, um, as a species is that, um, is that men discovered they were going to die. Now uh, I've had the opportunity, uh, unfortunately, to operate on many people who uh, have terminal illnesses and I've noticed that there's a rather unusual gender difference between um, men's attitude towards death and women's attitudes towards death. Uh, in general, in general, men are much more frightened to die than women are. Um, you know, the men demand more radical chemotherapy, more radical surgery, more radical um, uh, radiation therapy. And I believe that this difference uh, comes from the fact that women um, are, much, um, are much closer to the uh, rhythms of their body and the cycles of the earth uh, than men are, and they are much more accepting of fate than men are. So for example, if you were to ask a woman to draw you a metaphor for time, she'll draw you a circle, and if you ask a man to draw you a metaphor for time, 
he'll draw you an arrow. Arrows have beginnings and ends and circles don't. So men uh, began to suffer, well, of course, and these are two overlapping bell-shaped curves. There's many uh, exceptions to this rule, but in general. So we became the first anxious animal, you know, the first animal to experience anxiety all the time. The other animals experienced fear, but we ex experienced a, uh, um, existential angst. So what the men did with this, of course, is that they invented religions, and all the religions of the world uh, are characterized by a belief that when you die, you go someplace else, and that you're reborn into another world. So, um, so men having discovered this um, terrible thing that they're going to die, and there's no evidence from watching any other animal, even though other animals grieve for their masters and elephants seem to know when they're gonna die, there's no evidence that any other animal understands at a very early age that they are doomed, um, except humans. Now the third momentous insight that happened to us is that men discovered paternity. Um, now this is quite a concept, you know, there must have been some time in our distant past when some guy was looking at some woman who had just had a baby that looked a lot like him and, and he thought about that and he said, this is very mysterious, why does this child look so much like me, you know? And then suddenly he got it! he realized that he had contributed some essence to this woman nine months earlier and that somehow or other that made this particular child. And once he understood that this child was his child, then what happened is these two great insights, one about sex and one about death, crisscrossed in his brain and convulsed relations between men and women forevermore. Because men for the first time understood that they could cheat death a little bit if they knew who their children were. But ah, that's the question, isn't it? A woman never doubts who her children are because they come right through her, but a man never knows for sure. So the men wanted to be able to name their children, they wanted to be able to give them their weapons and their stocks and their bonds and their property, and they wanted to be able to live on through their children, but in order to do that, they had to be able to control women's sexuality and they had to be able to control women's reproductive rights. In every culture in the world, men want more children than women do. The first thing that happens when women get their rights or education is they start to limit the size of their family. Now, how is it that we humans um, became this extraordinary animal that's so different from all the others? And we like to think of ourselves as you know, very unique, but actually uh, biologists have been showing that more and more uh, humans are less and less unique. But we do have two physical adaptations that are quite unique. <laughs> And that is, number one, we are the only heel-to-toe walking animal on the planet. And the second one is we have the largest brain per body size of any other animal. And these two adaptations happen to be um, mutually exclusive. They're, they're, they're um, incompatible. Now, nobody knows why we stood up and started walking. I mean, what an odd thing to do. Every, all the other animals that are on the land, they get around on four legs and they seem to do it pretty well. Can, can you think of a single predator that you could outrun if he was chasing you? Can you think of a single four-legged prey that you could catch if you were running after it? Nobody knows why we stood up, you know? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But here we are, you know, almost four and a half million years ago, walking around uh, on two feet instead of four. And uh, there's some very strange things that happen to you when you stand up. Uh, one of them is that you realign and re-engineer your entire lower body. Um, and what happens, of course, is that all the birds and the fish and the mammals and the reptiles they all move through the world pretty much with their uh, vertebral columns horizontal to the earth, and we humans move with our vertebral columns vertical to the earth. So what we have done is we've positioned directly above our anus a huge mass of intestines, and uh, every person here is at risk for being turned inside out if you go for a stroll after a particularly heavy lunch. Um, <laughs> now this is a gravitational hazard that doesn't exist for other animals. So if you look at a picture of the human pelvis, it's shaped like a gigantic bowl and uh, one of its architectural functions is to prevent your guts from falling out your rectum. Now as a result of this, now as a result of this, the bony hole in the center of the pelvis is actually quite small. And um, uh, you know, we walked around for about two million years and then about one day we noticed, he said, gee, you know, look at that, your, our hands are free. What an interesting observation. And we dimly surmised that if only we had a big brain, that we could imagine a weapon that our free hands could brandish and then we would be really dangerous. And then about 400,000 years ago, we got our wish and in the most astonishing evolutionary event, the human brain added a whole pound of brain tissue within the astonishingly short period of 400,000 years, 
We went from a two-pound brain to a three-pound brain. Now, this created quite a problem for women because, you see, when you have big-brain babies, they have to fit through that little narrow bony hole. And the human female births the largest brain baby of any other species. So as any woman who's ever birthed a child knows that the mismatch between the size of the baby's head and the diameter of the bony canal it has to pass through is a terrible one. So women, um, uh, human females, began to have great difficulty delivering their young, and then a catastrophe occurred. The women began to die in childbirth. Now think about that. Now that's a very wasteful reproductive strategy. There are hardly any other species where females die in childbirth. You know, dogs and cats, they go in the back of the closet and they, they spit out these litters of six and eight, and they don't die in childbirth. But if you go and check the dates on cemeteries prior to the 20th century, you'll see that the childbirth was, was a very deadly thing. In fact, the New York Times reported a couple of weeks ago that one out of 16 women in Africa today die in childbirth. So uh, that's some statistics. So women, but not men, pass through what's known as an evolutionary bottleneck. They are the ones that had an environmental pressure that was um, causing their death that was not causing the men's. So women needed to understand the concept of time. They needed to be able to figure out the connection between sex and pregnancy. And they did that by aligning their, um, by natural selection, aligning and entraining their menstrual periods with the moon. It's, it's a very odd thing that the average length of the human female menstrual cycle is 29.5 days, which is exactly equal to a lunar cycle. Now, there are a lot of sea creatures that are timed, they have their breeding seasons and, the, and their ovulations timed to have uh, with lunar cycles, but we're a land animal. What's a land animal doing coordinating its menses with the moon. So over thousands and thousands of years, women were harmonizing their menstrual periods together and they were all sitting around and then finally one day, one, one place, some woman said, wait a minute, there's a pattern here. You know, th this, this happened last month. And once they understood the concept of a month, then uh, humans began to be able to be able to maneuver in the concept of time. And, um, and we humans are the only animals that can maneuver from past, present, and future to the degree that we can. There's no other animal that can do this. Uh, most other animals cannot uh, figure out what they're going to do next Thursday. And you can't make an appointment with a dog and expect them to keep it next Wednesday. You know? <laughs> but humans are capable of being able to uh, think very far into the future and make plans. And that is the key to our success, the original reason why we humans um, have been able to gain dominance over all the other animals. So some woman somewhere said, wait a minute, you know, this kicking in my belly is the direct result of that transient moment of pleasure I had with that man over there. And then she realizes she could die as a result of having sex. So once she realized that, uh, she also understood that if she survived the pregnancy, she was going to be saddled with the most helpless creature of any other offspring of any other animal. And furthermore, there is no other animal that if one of its offspring were to call it 25 years after the date of birth at 2 a.m. in the morning and say, I'm in trouble, would you please come, <laughs> that they would drop everything and go to the aid of their offspring. I mean, elks won't do that, and horses won't do that, cows won't do that. So the human female, contemplating the fact that she could die as a result of having sex, needed to gain a power, and a power that no female of any other species has ever had before, and it is the power to refuse sex when she's ovulating. Let's have a moment of silence here because every man in this audience understands that when women gained this power, that changed everything, okay? <laughs> Many women consider that the, uh, that the pill was the most liberating event in sexual history, but much earlier, some female was able to fend off some male who was trying to mount her and she must have mumbled in whatever proto-language was available at the time, free at last, free at last. <laughs> now, she was aided in this because the male of the human species was undergoing an a, a adaptation in the opposite direction that was making him the most sex-crazed animal on the face of the planet, you see. Uh, other males of other species are interested in sex only when the female goes into her period of estrus or heat or running season. The rest of the time, they're just not interested. I mean, a, a stallion would never think to try to mount a mare who wasn't in heat. If he did, she'd kick him in a real sensitive area. That'd be the end of him, you know? <laughs> But, um, um, but the human male became uh, this, this one particular animal that wanted to have sex all the time, okay? With all women, 
everywhere, any time, any place. I mean, there's no other male animal that wants to have sex like human males do, okay? So this rather particularly sex-crazed animal, um, uh, this presented quite a problem. You know, the, the other animals, uh, the other animals do not practice bestiality, by the way. Uh, we, we humans do, I mean. And as every woman in this audience know, every man has one brain and one penis and only enough blood supply to operate one at a time. You know? So the first male must have walked up to the first female and gone, <laughs> come on, baby, let's do it. And she looked at him and she said, you know what, you, know, you, you, you smell bad, you're, you're ugly, you're stupid, well, you know, we're not doing it. And he was confounded because no male of any other species has ever confronted a female with a mind of her own. So this forced the human male um, to uh, have to reassess the situation. I believe this is the place where misogyny begins when men begin to resent women because they, the women are, have the power to turn them away. So men had to formulate enough mental wattage to answer the question, what do women want? You know? and, and in order for them to be able to establish an entirely new relationship with women, they had to find the answer to this question. Now, unfortunately, uh, along the way, the men also underwent a neural makeover that allowed them to fall in love with women, which complicated matters. And men discovered that intimacy with a woman made them a more complete human being. So, um, so the men pondered this question, what is it that will finally get a woman to say yes? And, um, and you see, this is a very difficult question for most men, especially young boys who are in the height of their puberty. And unfortunately, most men don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> And answering this question is absolutely crucial because if a man can't get a woman to agree to have sex with him, then he can't pass on his genes, and essentially he's done for as far as natural selection is concerned. Now, the answer to the question of what women want is what women want is iron. Iron? Well, we're talking about the Pleistocene age now. We're talking about way back before diamonds and before money um, and resources and good uh, sense of humor and handsome and and uh, generous and all those other things. Because you see, iron is the atom that allows hemoglobin to carry blood from your, uh, to carry oxygen from your brain to your, um, uh, to your, from your heart to your brain and other organs. And without iron atoms, um, what happens is women suffer an iron deficiency anemia, and a woman who has an iron deficiency anemia who gets pregnant delivers a low birth weight baby who's at risk for being mentally retarded, and failure to thrive. So it's absolutely essential that a woman and a man have a lot of iron in their system in order to make the hemoglobin work. And the organ that re requires the most iron, it happens to be the brain because 25, 20 to 25% of every one of your heartbeats, blood, is designated to go to the brain to supply it. So um, isn't it odd that there are 4,000 species of mammals of which humans are one and less than 100 of them experience menstruation. And of those 100, it's, it's inconsequential. It happens very infrequently. The, the mammal that loses the most blood the most frequently is a human. Now, why is that? I mean, no obstetrician or reproductive physiologist has yet to come up with a credible reason why it's necessary why the human female lose all this blood every month to the point that on a CBC, it's considered normal, normal for the human female to have 15% less hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red cell count than a male. Why is that? I mean, why, why would it be normal when all the values on a urinalysis and a Chem 26 panel are the same for men and women? So women uh, lose this astonishing amount of blood over a lifetime due to menses. But uh, in earlier times, um, there's another reason why women lose blood, because when they get pregnant, uh, the fetus, in order for the fetal brain to develop, sucks out of the woman uh, one-eighth of all of the iron that she has in her system. So she has to supply all the iron for this fetal brain to develop normally. And then, as anybody who's ever witnessed a live human birth, you come away deeply impressed with how bloody um, a, a birth is. I mean, there's the, the, we are the species that suffers the highest number of, of lacerations. We have to do episiotomies. And of course, um, 
There's another factor, and that is that the human's placenta is the most um, effective placenta. And of course, when the placenta is uh, discharged, there's a period there where there's a gush of blood. We now have drugs that can stop that, but uh, before the, in the ancient times, they didn't have those. So women would lose a fair amount of blood just delivering a baby. And then, of course, once women start to breastfeed, um, what happens is they breastfeed over a period in hunter-gatherer tribes for two years and eight months. And during this period of time, although the milk is very low in iron, it's a very long period of time that they're losing iron. And then, of course, the minute that they stop lactating and stop breastfeeding, they start to menstruate again. So what ends up happening is over a woman's reproductive life cycle, from one avenue or another, she's constantly losing iron. Now, <clears throat> it's, it's been estimated that the human female loses 40 pints of blood over her lifetime from these six causes. Now, vegetables are very rich in iron because they glow in the soil, the soil contains iron. Unfortunately, vegetable iron is chelated. And chelated iron is very difficult for humans to absorb. So spinach, for example, which contains ferric iron, which is also hard to absorb, and chelated iron. So Popeye would not have gotten very much of a jolt from his famous gulp, because spinach pretty much goes right through you uh, in terms of the iron, and very little of it is absorbed. Now, it just so happens that the easiest form of iron to absorb happens to be animal protein, uh, meat, brains, liver. So um, the question is, you know, as long as we were living in Africa, everything was fine because there was plenty of vegetables to eat. If you eat enough vegetables, you can get enough iron. But then 70,000 years ago, we made this fateful decision to move north, and we walked right into the teeth of the worst ice age that this planet has ever seen. So there's not a whole lot of vegetables to eat in the wintertime. So as a result, um, we now come to the answer of why do men hunt? Because meat is the fastest, easiest way that a woman can replenish her iron stores and help birth healthy babies and remain vigorous and disease-free herself. So, you know, it's rather odd. There are 270 species of primates, of which humans are one. And 269 of these primate species are vegetarians. I mean, chimps and baboons eat a little bit of meat with less than 2% of their diet. But for all practical purposes, shoots, newts, roots, nuts, and fruits are what um, uh, other primates eat. One primate sits down and eats the flesh of another animal, which happens to be humans. And um, you know, plants have a characteristic that make them very easy to eat, and that is they can't run away. Um, uh, humans, if you want to eat something that's living, you first have to catch it and kill it. And the object of your attention is not particularly interested in being eaten. So you can figure that it's going to put up a very spirited defense. So here we are uh, sharing this planet with these fearsome, ferocious other predators that are equipped with big claws and huge canines and talons and speed and strength. And the winner of the gold medal for the predatory sweepstakes happens to be this particular, this animal here. This is the most dangerous predator on the planet. There is no other animal that can withstand the predations of this one creature. We are spreading death and destruction to every single large animal on this planet. We're going to eliminate every one of them except those we want to domesticate and keep. Now, if you don't believe this theory that men figured out that if they come with a gift of meat to a woman, that their likelihood that the woman is going to assent to sex, I would like you to uh, visit any romantic restaurant. And the next time, look around. And you will see that somewhere in the uh, restaurant by candlelight, some young man is wooing some young woman with the expectation that perhaps he's spending his valuable hunting money hoping maybe he's going to score. And what is it exactly that he's offering her, you know? Tofu is not going to do it, you know? Uh, maybe in California it will, you know? Salad's not going to, an appetizer, you know? Soup's not going to do it. It's a filet mignon. That's the most expensive thing on the menu, you know? And it's medium rare, you know? And the reason that it's red the reason that it's red is that the iron oxide, the, the hemoglobin and iron, is what makes meat red. So, so this is a very, very old deal. Now, the next question is, why is it that the human female has such a fulsome orgasm? You know, uh, other females do not appear to be enjoying sex. I mean, the, the male lion has a barb 
on the end of his penis because to prevent him from being dislodged during all of this bumptious pistoning. And when he withdraws, you can see that the female is in evident distress. He's so tender towards her that he bites her in the back of the neck to hold her still. Um, that, that's how much solicitous. Now, you know, um, I, I, sort of, I, I sort of love this slide. It looks like, I, it, it looks like she's saying, oh, oh, I forgot to turn off the gas, you know? I, I was up in Alaska and I was watching two elks doing it, you know, well, this stag was busily thrusting at the backside of this female. The female was, was munching on some clover. And I thought to myself, it doesn't look to me like she's really enjoying this experience, you know? The human female, on the other hand, the human female, on the other hand, has an orgasm that is unparalleled among any other species. I mean, there's no other animal that seems to reach the heights of ecstasy that the human female does. So the question is, why would natural selection install in the human female this feature that does not appear to be uh, um, uh, necessary for sexual reproduction in the, among the other things? Now, there's several different theories as to why this is so. Uh, one of them is the cuddles theory, which proposes that uh, you know, males and females, by really enjoying sex, uh, get it on often and frequently, and thus uh, produce a lot of babies, which then causes our species to uh, dominate the planet. But you know, there's a whole bunch of monogamous species, uh, ranging from wolves and prairie voles and, and gibbons and, uh, and albatrosses. And the, the, they're monogamous species, and the female doesn't have to lose her season in order to keep the male around. So, so that explanation doesn't do that. The other theory is the Polax theory. And the Polax theory states that, you see, um, the, mammalian, um, the mammalian mechanics of sex is pretty much the same for both men, uh, both uh, uh, all, all mammals. They, they all pretty much do it the same. But the difference is, is that we stood up while all the rest of them remained, uh, their vertebral column remained horizontal. So you see, uh, uh, the minute the male ejaculates, uh, the sper this little sperm start to swim of their life, you know, and they start swimming as fast as they can because when they're in the tunnel of terror, which for the sperm is the vagina, because the vagina has a pH that is very deadly to sperm. So um, they, they got to swim real fast and get inside the cervix where they won't fall out. But uh, their goal, of course, is to find that uh, the treasure at the end of the fallopian tubes, um, and only one of them can win. But the problem is, is that if a woman got up and started walking away immediately after sex, then what would happen is a very strange thing. All these little sperm that were swimming as fast as they can would suddenly start slipping backwards. And they would, if they looked over their metaphorical shoulder, they would realize that they were edging towards a precipice from which there was no return. So uh, they were looking horror on the fact that they're all going to fall out. So uh, natural selection had to figure out some way to stun the woman into sweet lassitude so she would remain recumbent and not go anywhere to give these sperm a chance to swim. So that's why it's called the Polax theory. It's as if someone hit her over the head with an uh, a, a axe handle and, and allowed her to remain flat so she's not going anywhere uh, because she wants to enjoy this moment. And while she's enjoying this moment, those little guys are swimming just as fast as they can to get inside the cervix where they're not going to fall out. Now, in my book, Sex, Time, and Power, I actually offer several alternative different theories. Because, you know, there's some very strange things about human sexuality. First of all, they've calculated for a young man, it's uh, from the moment of penetration to ejaculation is two minutes and 14 seconds. For a woman, for a woman uh, from uh, the moment of penetration to orgasm is well over 14 minutes. Who set this up? I mean, <laughs> what a strange uh, deal this is, you see. And when the man finishes ejaculating, he wants to get out of there. I and mean, all he wants to do is get dressed and leave, you know. So, so by, and then there's some other features, and that is that the human female is capable of sustained multiple repeats uh, of orgasm. And the man under her or over her is he spent, his reload time keeps lengthening as the older he gets. And then there's this very, very strange phenomenon that a male libido is the highest when a young boy comes into puberty, he has a 40-fold rise in his serum testosterone level, and a young boy, 14 years old, can masturbate all day long. I mean, he just can keep going and going and going and going. And then his libido after that just gradually tails off. And of course, the female libido rises slowly from puberty, hits its peak in her late 30s or early 40s, 
And this is about the same time that a man discovers he has a favorite chair. So, so, the, so the question is, the question is, you know, it's a very odd thing. I mean, Nietzsche, Nietzsche once said, Nietzsche once said that God is a comedian performing before an audience who's too frightened to laugh. And when you look at the usual, you know, I figured that men and women are so out of sync with each other that they finally get into sync, finally when they get to the nursing home, they're both interested in having a good bowel movement, you know? <laughs> but I think that the reason that the women's orgasm is delayed and she has such a fulsome orgasm is that when the man is finished and he wants to withdraw, he has to stay there and he has to pleasure this woman and she learns a lot about his character in those 12, 15 minutes of time. He can't let his attention wander, you know. He has, to, he has to be steadfast at his station because during that time she learns whether or not this guy is generous, healthy, creative, humorous, all the features and all the characteristics that she needs to know about this guy as to whether he's gonna be good husband material and good father material, she can learn in those moments during which time um, uh, he's pleasuring her. Now I want to move on to the G-spot. The G-spot was described by a German obstetrician, Grafenberg, in 1944. He gave no scientific evidence. He was in an obscure journal and he said, there is a secondary pleasure center that women have that can give them um, a secondary orgasm. And of course the G-spot is a little bit like the unicorn. You know, all the women uh, can see it. Uh, some women can see it. Then most men and a lot of women don't, don't know it exists. Uh, Freud uh, said that there is a vaginal uh, orgasm as well as a clitoral orgasm. And then, of course, along came, uh, and he said that the on-off switch for this is deep in the vagina, way outside the wall of the vagina, directly behind the pubic bone. Now, it so happens that women have discovered uh, that if they get in very odd positions, usually mounting the male backwards, um, uh, facing backwards, that the male member will stroke this uh, on-off button behind the pubic bone, and they will experience this um, extraordinary um, secondary uh, pleasure center and activate it. And um, of course, you can get into some really weird positions too and activate it. Uh, but Masters and Johnson did very extensive studies, and they said, you know, there is no secondary pleasure center. Um, they stroked the, the inside of women's vaginas with the feathers and whatnot, and they found. I don't know who they found the women to do this for, but anyway, they found that, uh, that the clitoral orgasm was the only one that a woman had and that the G-spot didn't exist and they dismissed it. Well, supposing the G-spot exists, but it has nothing to do with sex, because the only other time in a woman's life that she would experience rhythmic contractions on that, that, would, that would put the on button for this little uh, switch that's behind the pubic bone is in the last stages of delivery, when the baby's head is pressing down on her pelvis. And what happens, of course, is that women, um, uh, there are some women who experience a birth orgasm. Now, I wrote in my book about this one woman who described having the best orgasm she ever had in the course of delivering her baby. And when I wrote that, um, uh, after I wrote the book, um, I started receiving all these emails and, and phone calls from women from all over the world, actually, that were writing me. said, you know, geez, I, I have to tell you that I'm, when I read about this in your book, I was so surprised because this happened to me and I didn't ever told anybody about it because I thought it was so weird. But apparently this is not an isolated event. This has happened. And, um, you know, Nepenthe was the Greek uh, nymph who, uh, whose name meant surcease from sorrow. And Nepenthe is the circulating nurse inside the delivery room because when the G-spot is activated in the last stages of pregnancy, what happens is the brain releases endorphins and other psychoactive substances that allow the woman to take her mind off the crush that's going on between her legs. Now in Greek mythology, there were two twin brothers. Um, the twins were Morpheus and Thanatos. And Thanatos uh, was the god of death and Morpheus was the god of sleep. In fact, our drug morphine is named after Morphe, Morpheus. So isn't it interesting that, that a woman, when she has her most dangerous encounter with Thanatos, 
she enlists the help of his twin brother, Morpheus, to flood her brain with endorphins to take her mind off of what's going on. Um, so, so I believe that the G-spot is actually exists, but it's not there for secondary sexual pleasure. It's actually there for women who, uh, when they have a baby, they say, well, you know, it, it, it's very painful, but you tend to forget it, you know, and I think the forgetting it have, happens to do with the G-spot. Now, why is it that humans have such expressive sex homosexuality? There are 200 species that have been identified today that seem to have some homosexual activity, but none, no one has ever observed one male baboon penetrating anally another male baboon. So they do, they do a lot of dominance displays, a lot of male mounting, but there's no other species where we have the kind of florid expression of homosexuality that we humans do. And I believe that um, this has been very beneficial to our species, that it's built into our genes. We know historically that just about every culture in the world and every society in the world has described and has had homosexuality amongst it. And um, it's not at all unusual <laughs> that um, homosexuality has been uh, in all the different cultures. Now, I think that all humans are psychic hermaphrodites, that we all have an anima and an animus, as Jung described. And the reason for this is that we come together for such lengthy um, relationships in order to raise children that each a male and a female have to be able to relate to the um, opposite side of their psyche within the opposite number of the pair. So there's like these two bell-shaped curves of male and female. Every man here recognizes that he has a feminine side and a masculine side, and every woman uh, has the same. And in order for us to do that, so we're basically hermaphrodites psychically. Uh, we have a masculine side and we have a feminine side. And of course, these are two overlapping bellships. We all know some women that make much better uh, hunter killers than some men. Um, and of course, we all know some uh, men that make much better uh, mother nurturers than some women. But in the main, these divisions hold. Now out at the edges of these bell-shaped curves is where we find homosexuality because if you're living in a tribe and you're a child, it's very beneficial for you to have an aunt or an uncle who has no children of their own. So the child-rearing responsibilities of humans are so vast and so difficult that it's very beneficial uh, that you have a certain percentage of males and females who don't have children of their own. Now, this has um, caused me in the book to write about what I call the theory of eights uh, for males. There's a very strange distribution that 8% of men are gay. 5% of women are lesbians. 8% of men are colorblind, meaning they're color deficient. They can't tell red from green. Wife says, you know, you've got a red sock on and a green sock on. He says, I do. And that's the first time they notice it. Uh, no women have uh, color deficiency. 8% uh, of men are left-handed. Uh, only 5% of women are left-handed. And 8% of men are bald in their prime. And you virtually find no women that are bald in their prime. In fact, baldness is a very odd feature. You didn't say bald dogs or bald cats. So why would we see these odd 8% features that afflict the human male, but not necessarily the human female or other animals? And it so happens that um, if, you, if you start with gays and lesbians, um, it turns out that 99% of the hominid experience we lived as hunter-gatherers. So you have to remember that. And we have a nervous system that's adapted to being hunter-gatherers. And they've done rather extensive studies, and they find that the optimal size of a hunter-gatherer tribe is 150 to 225 people. And you know what? It still holds today. I mean, if you have a wedding, what's the maximum number of people you invite that you would consider your tribe? I mean, it's 150 to 225 people. Now, it so happens, it so happens that within that tribe, the hunting party consisted of nine to 12 men in their prime. That was the hunting party. And you know, today, uh, you know, a baseball team, a baseball team has nine members, uh, a jury has 12, a football team has 11, uh, there's nine Supreme Court justices, there's uh, 12 apostles, there were 12 Greek gods. This template, a squad in the army is 10 men. I mean, it's still 10 to 12, nine to 12 men in their prime as to why, and the reason that women don't hunt, they're not part of this hunting party, is where in this scene could you insert a nine month pregnant woman or a woman with nursing, uh, nursing a baby or responsible for the care of small children? So 
So if you had 12 men being your hunting group, and one of them was gay and didn't have a family to feed, that meant that when they killed a woolly mammoth or brought down a big animal, that there was 8% more meat to distribute among the women and children back at the home base than there would be uh, if all the men had a family to feed. Now, why would men be colorblind? I mean, think about this. We're primates. We swing through the trees. We don't have wings. We depend on our color vision and our stereoscopic vision to make sure that we grab the right vine, otherwise we fall to our death. So color vision deficiencies would be a terrible thing for a primate to develop. So why would it have evolved only in males? Well, it turns out that 8% of men cannot tell that there is a number in that chart. And if you're one of the men looking at that um, chart and you can't see the number in it, you're one of the uh, 8%. And, and it's, it's interesting that a lot of men don't even know they have it. But it so happens that in World War I, uh, and primates, as I mentioned, uh, need to have color, the best defense that an animal has against the human predator is to stand still and blend in with its environment. Now, it so happens that in World War I and World War II, the military actively recru uh, recruited colorblind men because a colorblind man can see right through camouflage where a color vision man cannot. So they would put these guys directly on the front lines and they would say, well, there's a tank over there and a gun over there because they could see through it. So it would pay to have one member of your hunting party who could see through camouflage. Now, uh, most of you cannot identify that there's a person sitting on a rock in this picture, but if you uh, look real closely, you can see that there's somebody that blends in right with him. A, a colorblind man would be able to spot this person immediately. Now, we come to this pesky problem of the 8% of people that are left-handed. Think about it. I mean, if right-handedness was so beneficial to our species, why aren't we all right-handed? Or alternatively, why aren't 50% right-handed and 50% left-handed? Why do we have this strange percentage of 92% right-handed and 8% left-handed? Well, it so happens that as you look forward, both of your eyes see the same thing, the slightly different angle. But the visual cortex in the back of your brain see something entirely different. So your right hemisphere, if you're right-handed, sees everything that's to your left, and your left hemisphere sees everything that's to your right. And it turns out that your right hemisphere, if you're right-handed, is the one that's better for judging distances than, uh, and visual spatial things than your left hemisphere. So that's why when two cars arrive in an intersection, the person whose right hemisphere is, sees the other car coming as a right of way, and that's why base runners and, and, and race cars go around the track counterclockwise because you want to see what's coming up at you from the left uh, better because your right hemisphere sees that. Well, if you're in a hunting party, you know, if you've ever watched a quarterback, you throw best to your left if you're right-handed. Trying to throw and hit something to your, running to your right is very difficult if you're right-handed. So it pays to have somebody who can throw left-handed as well as somebody who can throw right-handed as well as the fact that animals don't always run to the left, they some of them run to the right. So as a result, it pays to have one hunter that's left-handed out of your hunting party. So um, as a result of, of being right-handed and left-handed, you have the best of both possible worlds in a hunting party if one of your guys is left-handed. Now that brings us to the other question of baldness. 8% uh, of men are bald in their prime, 40% of men lose their hair uh, at some point in their life um, and are, become bald. Baldness doesn't make any sense at all if you're living on the Serengeti because it so happens that the human brain is the most metabolically expensive and organ in the body. It generates an enormous amount of heat. So we have this elaborate cooling system, just like an automobile engine, where we run cooler blood over the scalp through this network of scalp rings and arteries. Anybody who's ever cut their scalp knows that it bleeds and bleeds and bleeds because we have such a rich plexus of veins. And then on top of that, we have a tuft of hair. And the purpose of the hair is to insulate your brain from the heat so you don't get heat stroke. Now, the reason that people who live near the equator have frizzier hair than people who live in northern climes is that by having the hair be frizzy, it traps more air close to their scalp and, and thus insulates the brain from the heat of the, equ uh, the equator. So, what would have been the advantage to a bald man on this? I mean, the guy would be die, die a heat stroke if he was running around on the, uh, on the savannas. You, 
Bald men uh, never go out into the uh, hot sun without a hat on because they understand this. Well, it so happens that the bow and arrow was not invented until 15,000 years ago. So for the first couple million years of our hunting experience, you had to get real close to an animal if you wanted to kill it with sticks and spears and stones. So, um, so until you had the bow and arrow, you really couldn't do distance. So in studying hunter-gatherer tribes, they found that the, like the Kung San of, of the uh, Kalahari, they disguise themselves, they get downwind, they do everything they can to not alert the uh, prey that, that the human predator is near. Now all the animals have what's known as flight distance instinct. They have to learn to recognize who their enemies are because if they don't, they go extinct. And the reason that the Australian and the uh, North American mammals were killed off so rapidly is they've never seen humans before. The African mammals have grown up living with humans, so they developed a very good flight instinct um, response. And whenever they saw the silhouette of a human, they ran like hell. So uh, we humans have a very distinctive silhouette. We look like lollipops. You know, we're brains on a stick. You know, we're the only, we're the only predator that looks like this, you know. So what we've learned, we have to get, creep up on them. And then at some point, you've got to be able to stick your head up over a rock and take a look to see where the prey is. And the animals learned that whenever they would see this mop coming up <laughs> over a rock, that what followed was two round eyes and then all hell would break loose. So, um, so if you were bald, then the animal would be confused. And you know, in order to sneak a peek, you have to expose your pate. So as a result, um, a bald man can get closer to prey than a man with hair, which leads to the in ineradicable myth that, that bald men are more virile than, um, than men with hair, because I think they're the best hunters. Now, what attracts a man to a woman? You know, this is very odd when you think about it, because this is the way, this is how all the other male animals are attracted to the females. I mean, the male picks up this uh, pheromone that the female gives off in heat or estrus or rutting. Uh, he comes from miles around, he sniffs, he says, yeah, yeah, time's right, it's about right to, to do it. Then they engage in these extraordinary dominance fights where they, uh, they fight to see some males strut their stuff, uh, other males uh, dance till they drop in the most elaborate courting displays. Some males sing their hearts out, hoping that maybe that will be the key to winning the female, you know. <laughs> but they all have this uh, means of attempting to do this. Um, and this is the method that's worked for millions of years, for millions of species. It, it, it reproductively it worked terrifically. So the question is, why did we humans abandon this? Why is it that uh, the human male and female are drawn to each other by totally different uh, signals? Um, you know, there's three million sexually reproducing species, and one of them we know for sure does not emit any signal that the male can pick up, and that's a human. These two guys do not have a clue as to where this woman is in her menstrual cycle. I mean, this woman got up this, in the morning, she shampooed, she showered, she washed, she put perfume on. There's no way that this guy is going to be able to figure out whether or not she's ovulating or not. In fact, the women themselves don't know when they're ovulating often. They have to go to Walgreens and they have to buy a thermometer because they themselves don't know for sure. So what would be the advantage to our species of having this? What, what would attract a man to a female if it's not heat or estrus or rutting season? I mean, you would have thought that natural selection would have fitted out women with gorgeous colors or, or polychromatic scales or the most spectacular feathers. But no, that's not, the, that's not the signal. The signal that, that activates a male's lust and has him go into his courting display is three things. Youth, health, and beauty. That's the thing that causes a man to suddenly become very active and get an erection and want to mate with this female and, and find her. And so this explains why men buy pornography and why women spend a lot of money on cosmetics. because. Um, <laughs> These three things are the key to what drives a male um, and causes him to be interested in a female. All women want to be, look young, healthy, and beautiful, and the men are all seeking young, healthy, beautiful women. Um, not all men, of course, but the mo mostly mo young men. So what is the substance that gives a woman this extraordinary beauty? And the substance is a very odd one when you think about it. The substance happens to be fat. 
oleaginous subcutaneous fat. Fat is the substance that drives men wild. <laughs> fat, in all the right places, gives women high cheekbones, full lips, you know, causes the commotion of her buttocks when she walks, it causes all the men's head to turn, the jiggle of her breasts. It's subcutaneous fat. What an odd choice. Now the next time you're <laughs> The next time you're rubbing your dog's belly, I want you to pick up the dog's skin, and you'll notice that the dog does not have any subcutaneous fat, or very little of it. We, we like to think of pigs as being very fat, but actually pigs have very little subcutaneous fat. All the fat in these animals is in their thoracic and abdominal cavities. Humans have 10 times more subcutaneous fat than other mammals except for one, which are sea mammals, like manatees and whales and dolphins, and with them we call it blubber, and I'm sure that many of us in the audience can relate. Um, <laughs> so the thing that drives men wild is subcutaneous fat, and of course uh, this was best summed up by uh, the uh, jazz singer Fats, Fats Waller, who once uh, crooned, uh, must be jelly because jam don't shake like that. You know? <laughs> now, in summary, in summary, men, men tend to think with their penis. Women, young, especially young girls and women, tend to think with their hearts. Neither think with their brains, unfortunately. So male-female relations ends up being this enormous chess game and the purpose that the man has is to try to uh, disarm the woman's queen and render her emotionally defenseless. And the female is trying to capture the male's king and capture his heart. And this is the reason why so often the relationship game ends up in stalemate. Um, too often, male relations between men and women, because of these differing agendas, um, are like this. And unfortunately, there are some male-female relationships that end up like this. But of course, when it works, and when it's right, and two people are able to love each other in a way that brings them together so that they remain together, and they stay together to raise their children to maturity, then this is what keeps the human species going. I hope this presentation has allowed you to think of human sexuality in a different way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll be leading a discussion group today uh, right out here uh, where we can ask questions and talk about this further. Um, what time do we say it is? 3.30. 3.30, we'll meet right out here. And also, I brought uh, copies of my books and uh, as well as um, DVDs and videos of this lecture, but performed in a different place for all of my books. And those are available as well. Thank you very much.